Welcome back to the margins of Riga Stratcom Dialogue 2022. I am delighted to now be joined by Natalia Popovich. Natalia is a uh, civic activist, international Stratcom expert, an entrepreneur, and she has been at the forefront of Ukraine's efforts to counter Russian hybrid operations since 2014. She is the co-founder of the Ukraine Crisis Media Center, one of the leading NGOs in Ukraine countering Russia's disinformation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for invitation. So, you know, when it comes to uh, looking back at the period uh, when Putin decided to launch this latest brutal, unprovoked invasion, there are kind of credible re inside reports suggesting that the Kremlin believed it would be a brief war, so, uh, kind of uh, that they would have the ambition of taking Kiev within perhaps even five days, some reports say. This has clearly uh, not been the case. Uh, Ukraine's resistance has been... Uh, of heroic it has been inspiring and it is clear that the ukraine putin is fighting today is not the same as ukraine as in 2014. could you perhaps shed some light on what is the transformation that has happened in ukraine considering that you, you lived there uh, most of your life what has been the adaptation that has taken place right i think it's really interesting to what extent uh, russia has miscalculated um, the ukraine's will to resist um, unfortunately, it's not just Russia who miscalculated. Um, I think if you read the recent uh, uh, editorial by the New York Times, you will see that uh, the West sometimes continues to miscalculate it. Um, I believe Ukrainians are kind of professional resistors to Russia. It's just that they have not understood that yet. But you're right, in 2014, we would not have been as ready to resist in this way as we are now. And some major things have happened since 2014 that have helped Ukraine to build our resilience and our resolve that, that now everybody sees. First of all, um, the re revolution of dignity happened to Ukrainians. And this was the revolution that I think activated um, the core values of what Ukrainians stand for. Um, I think we fought for freedom and independence before, obviously, but I think revolution of dignity gave many more Ukrainians this sense that you have to defend democracy every single day and it's your personal responsibility. So if previous revolutions, Ukrainians would kind of hand over the power to manage or counter to the president or the government or somebody, revolution was this key thing that brought this feeling of responsibility to Ukrainians. And then after Revolution of Dignity, um, through the uh, rise of the civil society and many organizations such as Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Stop Fake, Euromaidan Press, many others, um, as well as the government changing its policy and understanding that we need to work more with the core foundation of Ukraine's memory of how we see the, ourselves, to what extent we see truthful history of ours, many initiatives have taken place. So, for example, ever since 2014, we've changed completely the calendar of the national holidays. We used to have um, the Soviet holiday of a Defender's Day on the 23rd of February. We used to celebrate Great Patriotic War on 9th of May. Um, new holidays have come up or new commemorations have come up. So we started giving credit to the World War II as the tragedy and commemorate all of the civilians and the people in different armies that Ukrainians have lost and changed completely how we view um, the learnings of the Second World War. We've uh, began to have new holidays already dedicated to the new defenders of Ukraine because the war for us did not start on 24th of February 2022. It actually started when Russia annexed Crimea and went over to start the war in Donbass. So we started having people, you know, Ukrainian war veterans and the defenders and the new commemorations related to them have emerged. Then the new Ukrainian institutions, cultural institutions have um, been founded, like Ukrainian Cultural Foundation that gives seed grants to many Ukrainian cultural initiatives, and uh, which enabled for Ukrainian language and publishing to flourish, for Ukrainian music to be more represented in TV, radio, etc. formats. And um, it has grown the feeling of you know, um, self-confidence and appreciation of new modern Ukrainian culture rooted in our deep ancient history, but at the same time, you know, created 
created for the 21st century. And I think the last eight years have been extremely transformative for that. Also within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, uh, they found that Ukrainian Institute, and I'm you know privileged to be honored to be on a, on a board of it, which is a Ukrainian um, state institution that helps to explain Ukraine uh, to foreign audiences and helps build partnerships with various players abroad. So many things have happened, I think, who have contributed to the strengthening of the Ukrainian core identity. And the Ukraine that Russia attacked on 24th of February uh, was this more strengthened Ukraine um, with a resolve not to let any of our neither territories nor, nor people. So it's a very, we are a very different enemy now. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you for this introduction. You mentioned the uh, mission or challenge of uh, communicating Ukraine or explaining Ukraine internationally. And of course, this uh, immediately enters you in a global battlefield because uh, Russia, for instance, has been also been trying to communicate Ukraine globally, right? Promoting uh, all sorts of uh, malign narratives about ranging from Ukraine is, you know, hopelessly corrupt or Ukraine is fascist where Ukraine is uh, ultra-nationalist, uh, sort of what has been, um, what has been the approach in, uh, in encountering these narratives on, on a global scale, not just in the West? I think uh, many numer like many civil society organizations, as well as some of the state centers, um, have tried to counter the Russian disinformation about Ukraine in the information the global information space. Um, at least for the last eight years, it was done in a more systemic way. So, for example, the functioning of UCMC or the functioning of Stop Fake would mean that um, any Russian negative narrative regarding Ukraine false narrative, um, would receive attention and would receive a expert commentary on behalf of Ukrainians. Um, at least it would not be neglected. So in the last eight years, I can say Ukraine started speaking for itself. Whether we were winning or not winning that um, that battle um, is, a, is a difficult one to say. Probably not, because if we were winning, maybe we would not have come to, you know, to where we are right now. Um, but I think Ukraine definitely was making many more efforts to explain itself. And... Um, in reality, uh, Ukraine's real situation always disproves what Russia says about us. Because, you know, when we happen to choose um, a third top person in the country, because, you know, previously we've had the prime minister who was of Jewish origin and, and the president who was also of Jewish, and, and now we have a Jewish president. So it's much easier, I think, for us to say, well, look, obviously we are not anti-Semitic and obviously you cannot accuse us of Nazism if, if um, the parties that are ultra-right or ultra-whatever, uh, they never have made into any, even into Ukrainian local commune parliament, not not even on the scale of national parliament, which is um, which, which means that we, we give them zero support in comparison to how they're faring in many other European societies, unfortunately. Um, so we've tried to counter these particular um, uh, false narratives, uh, but I think the, the bigger kind of challenge was that um, Russia is such a dominant and well-resourced culture. Russia has been ex exporting itself as this, you know, imperial big culture for years and years, and 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 putting most of the much of the oil and gas money into uh, these ballets and ventures and sports competitions and and all of these soft power, um, sort of soft power techniques. Uh, but in reality, unfortunately, as we now see through the behavior they exhibit, you know, in Ukraine in the course of this war, and also which they unfortunately have exhibited in many at least of the sports sports um, competitions um you know they're not a, a fair player you know they're they're a, a rogue player and uh, uh there is no culture behind somebody who you can you can maybe send your ballet to um for on the world tour but if at the same time your soldiers are raping and killing children that is a huge you know cognitive dissonance now that they would have have to to deal with and um unfortunately that reality kind of beats any disinformation that Russia would want to engage with. I think, unfortunately, the reality of war is always stronger than any disinformation that can can tell you something um, something otherwise. Another big factor I would have to say is that um, for explaining Ukraine to outsiders, the huge um, difference um, was made by the media uh, this year, who started coming to Ukraine as soon as U.S. intelligence started. You mean international media? International media, who started coming to Ukraine as soon as U.S. intelligence um, 
were kind of warning that these are the signs of war, imminent war that we are seeing. Because having CNN, BBC, um, you know, CNBC and all of all of them on the ground, uh, not from Moscow, not self-censored, but in, in Kyiv, in Lviv, in Kharkiv, uh, going and seeing the country for themselves, not being able to find, you know, where are these persecuted Russian speakers, you know, or what are what are the the, the foundations for these baseless lies that Russia has been uh, has been um, promoting. This has made a huge difference because, of course, the coverage that started coming out just prior to the war and during the first weeks of the war is very truthful and it was very real, very authentic. Um, and I think it has created, you know, the, the foundation for a lot of the support that Ukraine now is feeling from the world. You actually, this is an interesting point. You mentioned the uh, weeks leading up to the war where it seems that U.S. and maybe British intelligence agencies adopted a fairly uh, fairly novel, fairly um, you know, extraordinary strategy of publicly releasing class- classified intelligence uh, about r- impending plans of Russian invasion, you know, therefore kind of signaling to the Russians that, you know, we know what you are doing, maybe taking away the element of surprise, but also maybe creating, fostering some insecurity within the Kremlin that, you know, somebody is clearly leaking this information. Uh, what lessons do you think can be garnered from this? Do you think that it also a bit maybe changes the, f- it raises questions about the future role of journalists, that maybe journalists should a- also somehow now be trained in this open source intelligence uh, uh, kind of capabilities? Oh. I think this is very va- valuable, and I think open source journalism, as well as in, you know, that's its contribution to investigative journalism overall. I think is still very much kind of un- underappreciated, and only when major leaks come out, you know, be it Panama leaks or be it you know something of this sort, do we gain more appreciation of uh, how how important it would be across the world, and how much how how beneficial it would be if we we if we just had more transparency on, 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 on matters. Um, so I think this is extremely important. Mm, also, I think um, from the strategic perspective, uh, whenever someone does something that Russia does not expect them to do, that's good, because that means that there is a bit of a lead way. Um, um, for Ukraine, I think it was very difficult <clears throat> the first, um, the weeks leading up to the war when um the U.S. government was repeatedly saying, if the war happens, it's going to be up to Ukrainians to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. I think this was a very difficult moment um, because this was the moment of accepting that it's just in our hands, that no one is going to come to rescue. And, and I think it repeated sort of the feeling, for example, I personally had in uh, uh, during the Revolution of Dignity, during Maidan, when I think the first months, Ukrainians were kind of hoping that, you know, the, the big guys are going to come and somehow speak to Yanukovych and resolve it. And it the, the were, there have been these visits of international, you know, prime ministers coming and trying to negotiate. But then there was this point of kind of growing up and understanding, no, this government is no longer legitimate for us. We will have to take care of it ourselves. And I think this is exactly the kind of moment on a, on a mental resilience sort of um, plateau that we're experiencing right now when there is this resolution that you probably feel in the armed forces of Ukraine, in the territorial defense, in all of the millions of Ukrainians inside and outside of Ukraine that are doing the informational war mm-hmm. or battling. Mm, I think this is the moment where Ukrainians feel this is what we have to do. This is our role. Yes, we may get help, hopefully, but this is our role. This is our war. So I think this raises the question of, uh, of course, Ukraine as a society is mobilized. It's its citizens, uh, you know, million, tens of millions of Ukrainians. Its armed forces, you know, morale, as you said, is exceptionally high. I think the question is how to sustain the political will to outlast Putin in this kind of uh, strategic uh, confrontation because it is, I think, the kind of unpleasant truth maybe for many audiences here in the West, even in even in this country, but maybe less so, is that you know there will be no quick victory. There is no quick quick end of, end of resolution in sight. And you see already maybe some efforts. Oh, maybe we should have a ceasefire. Maybe Ukraine should uh, you know. Uh, give give something up for the sake of uh, stopping bloodshed, because of course, who doesn't want to stop bloodshed? So, my my question to you is: Do you have faith uh, that uh, the West will have the harbor the political will to maintain sanctions, to 
sustain the isolation of Russia in, in the long term? I find it hard to speak for the West, but I know that Ukrainians um, will not surrender. I believe that Ukrainians will resist in whatever way they can. I hope that um, what happened in the last 90 plus days already demonstrates that uh, Ukraine has been helped, but in some instances too late. Um, that unfortunately we could have prevented probably you know, more losses of life if the weapons that we have requested have been provided sooner. Mm. And um, I think Ukrainians will... This is the, the different situation from Russia because in Russia, Russia will do what, what the top leadership says. Ukraine is a different country. We're a democracy. So even if political establishment of Ukraine at some point decided we want to surrender or we want to... Not surrender, we want to, you know, do concessions... But those would be unacceptable to the Ukrainian society. Any political leader in Ukraine would be in a very, very difficult position because the country had suffered so much and, and the kind of the level of atrocities that we had gone through in, in those Ukrainian cities, they call for justice. And I think Ukrainians will not settle for anything until there is some form of justice. And I mean, it can take many shapes and forms. Um, you know, we've spoken that it should not be Hague International Court, but it should be um, Mariupol um, International uh, Tribunal. But there has to be um, a great number of people um, that should be brought to, to justice for inspiring this war, for um, for undertaking this war, and for leading to these atrocities. Without that, it's just, you know, Ukrainians will not feel safe living next to people who rape, kill, and loot. I mean, there is no basis for, for lasting peace, so it's not going to be enough for us. I completely agree with your point. I think that uh, the, the way, uh, of, course, of course, any equation that leads us to lasting, lasting peace must have this uh, kind of justice at the core of it. Uh, I think that maybe it is often misguided when we, when we think about you know, the post-war rebuilding, re the reconstruction effort. We focus on things like infrastructure, you know, or uh, kind of uh, some sort of political settlement or some diplomatic negotiations. But of course, uh, the healing must uh, first and foremost focus on the on the fabric of the society, right? Absolutely. And even if you look at uh, um, just purely the psychological drama of all of the people who have suffered, not just through bombings but through wars, um, we know that there is a process, and that process of uh, being able to rebuild your own life cannot happen until you know that your perpetrator has been punished. So that means um, that if we immediately go to some ceasefire and recovery, that we leave millions of people, millions of people whose lives completely disrupted, some ruined, and with no sense of closure. And it's not a productive nation. We need to also remember when, you know, that's why I was so, you know, appalled when, when I saw that New York Times editorial um, a week ago in which they basically were advising President Biden to focus on the level of inflation in the United States and forget about the war in Ukraine to appease Putin and for Ukrainians to just concede some territories. Um, it's just an ignorant writing because that means that people don't understand it's not about territory. It's not just about even the scorched earth strategy that Russia is pursuing. 15.5 uh, million Ukrainians have fled their homes. 5.5 million moms and kids are abroad. Unless they know it's safe, they're not going to come back. So there is no recovery. You can you can do a lot of you know beautifully rebuilt buildings in Mariupol or Bucha, but if people don't feel safe there, they're not going to come back. And um, and there will not be that country that can be in between the current border of EU and NATO yeah. and Russia. So I think there, is, there are some strategic questions that these international organizations have to ask of themselves. Are we stronger with Ukrainians mm -hmm. in, or are we stronger when Ukrainians are going to be exterminated? It's also because we see and, and analyze the war. We see what is happening with Ukrainians uh, on the territories which Russia occupies. And they're abducted, they're arrested, you know, they're persecuted. So that fate awaits eventually, you know, all of us, people like myself and my friends. We don't want that happen to us. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to the remarkable fighting spirit that the Ukrainian people have shown, uh, 
uh, you as a kind of a culture expert, I wanted to ask maybe about the role of two factors when it comes to activating this mobilization. The first is the role of leadership, the role of personal leaders. And at least among Western audiences, uh, President Zelensky has uh, become a kind of a, a rock star, so to say, a cult figure. You know, this uh, phrase, uh, I need ammo, not I need ammunition, not a ride, this kind of... Uh, um, direct, transparent communication with people using social media, not sitting in some golden office uh, in some uh, marble castle on the Black Sea. Uh, this has really resonated. And uh, what I'm curious about is sort of your insider Ukrainian perspective. Are you at all surprised by the role that he has taken on? And do you think it has been decisive in achieving this level of mobilization? I think it's very. I think the role of leadership is very important, and I believe that um, you know, ever since the very first day of war, president has been excellent in his uh, communications, and uh, I think the whole country and society sort of wakes up to hear from him and and goes to sleep, you know, after having heard from him, and uh, not just him, but I think all of our ministers, and key ministers, um, Minister Kuleba, um, the Foreign Affairs, and and the Minister of Defense are trying to be, I think as transparent and, and forthcoming in their communications, which is fantastic. This is um, something that, again, only after the revolution of dignity, uh, also through the efforts of some of the initiatives that I was part of, we were able to bring this into um, the forefront, you know, how important it is to do it regularly and systemically and openly, as much as openly as you can. So I think this is working really well, and um, this is great. I think it's a two-way street, though. Mm. I think um, that... President Zelensky is communicating in this way because he know he stands with and on his shoulders and, and, and is surrounded by the society that mm -hmm. wants Ukraine to win. And he feels this um, positive pressure in a way um, that's coming from, from the people in the armed forces and in the territorial defense and, and from the civil society overall. Mm, and I think this is, this is very important because um, maybe I would have wished Ukraine to be a little bit more prepared for the war. Maybe I would have wished that every Ukrainian city and every Ukrainian citizen had a you know brochure had, which was sent to them before the war started, what to do and where to go and how to react. And I probably would have wished for you know better bomb shelters to be arranged, knowing that imminent threat you know is happening. Um, we we did not have all of that in place, but uh, the remarkable leadership and the communication that happened you know the minute the war started. We have that, and we are grateful for that, and I hope he's going to continue in, in the same sort of spirit. And um, he has full support of the entire country, you know, with him, as long as we can take Russia to accountability. And, and the second uh, aspect I wanted to ask about is uh, the role of symbols. And uh, in specific, specifically, I think these uh, kind of heroic tales of resistance in the face of, uh, you know, in the face of being outnumbered, in the face of, you know, risking it all for the sake of your country have really resonated. So the story of the sailors on Zmini Island and uh, recently, of course, the defenders of Azovstal uh, plant in, in Mariupol. Uh, could you speak about the role that these symbols have played? Do you think that uh, has, has Ukraine kind of instrumentalized these symbols in STRATCOM, in in mobilizing uh, the support of their country? Sort of how has this come about? Mm, I, th I think uh, the stories you're referring to, they're organic in a way. I mean, um, the story as me and the island happened and it was recorded and communicated as we thought it was happening, you know. So um, there was, a, in, in the span of 24 hours, understanding that, that, that you know, the, the, the soldiers sent uh, the Russian ship to go very far away and... And immediately, of course, it was picked up as kind of the first point of a little bit of a victory. Okay, even if we, even if everybody died, or even if everybody, as we found out, some of them were captured, etc. But but still, that symbol of saying we can, and this is what we feel and say to 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 Russians, this was extremely important. And I think also the story of uh, Azovstal, you know, it's um, it's a very authentic story and story that. Um, can, 
that's been so misunderstood previously because as you know even within ukraine not everybody understood the role of um, azov uh, battalion and azov uh, Har- 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 and especially abroad you know just like ukrainians are called nazis and there have been numerous publications and uh, numerous articles mm-hmm. there where sort of azov were misrepresented as villains there they were not as you know more as a, as a patriots who came to defense of the city um so those were very authentic stories and i think well people related to them because people always relate to the true show true demonstration of of courage so i think these these modern stories um, the same as as of a lady with a with a um, jar of uh, cucumbers yeah. you yeah. know or tomatoes and others um those are important stories that do come out but i think they're all rooted in 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 reality and this is what makes them shareable and what makes them so so easily uh, kind of picking up the spirit Uh, but I also think that other things have come to the fore that we did not appreciate before. So, for example, if you think of uh, the Ukrainian anthem, um, we will lay our body and soul for the freedom and we are of a Cossack king. Um, I don't think before people really understood the meaning of those words. You know, to them, were like they were like too far away, too distant in history. And um, even though anthem has been used as a symbol during the revolution of dignity, it's been played on Maidan every single hour, mm-hmm. basically, to keep up the spirit of the people in the most difficult moments. But only now, I think, it plays, you know, truly the role of an anthem where, where you know, when when, it, when you sing it, you truly understand the meaning of every single word. The same as with uh, the super um, popular now song uh, about the... We burn, you know, the um, Oyu Luzi Chervona Kalena, ah, which yeah, been yeah, sang yeah. by Pink Floyd and Kifnes. You know, so this is a song from 100 years ago, uh, another war, which all of a sudden, 100 years later, came out it's again. Required a whole, required new, a whole uh, new meaning. Mm-hmm. And now it's modern. And now it's being, you know, now mm-hmm. you don't have to tell anybody to sing it. People just sing it for the sake of staying sane and 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 resilient. Um, the same was Trident. You know, the same was our... The, the, so all of the key national symbols, they uh, within a war like that, within a setting like that, they become relevant all of a sudden. And uh, that becomes very organic. So perhaps as a kind of a concluding question, uh, you know, uh, we're now in Riga in Latvia. If you walk the streets of the city, you see Ukrainian flags everywhere. On looks almost seems like every, every corner to me. Uh, you know, in Latvia, you are among friends. I think Ukraine is on everyone's mind here, and Ukraine is surely on everyone's mind at this conference as well. But uh, is there something that uh, you think that we still that we still don't understand that 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 uh, you know maybe us less so maybe uh, western europeans a bit more but even here is there something that we are still naive about that we that we still don't get even if we were friends that we still just don't get well first of all i'm super grateful you know to um latvia and, and other baltic states um i think we do feel as a family here and i think it comes um on one hand from a um shared history of um um soviet occupation and from very similar sufferings you know i i presume that in many families of of latvians and estonians and lithuanians just like in ukraine there isn't almost any there almost isn't a generation that has not suffered from russians so we know it at the kind of core of our being what russia is um I think we are here as, as friends, and I think you are doing more than you can, right, to support Ukraine. The Prime Minister today has mentioned um, about a third of your defense budget mm-hmm. that's being given to Ukraine. And I think it is, um, you know, it's kind of morally a very noble gesture. I think it is also acknowledging the fact that um, you really understand that Ukrainians are fighting not just for Ukrainians. Because if, for example, we imagine the horrific situation of Russia succeeding in Ukraine and wiping out, you know, 40 million Ukrainians, there will be no longer 40 million Ukrainians to defend anybody else, not just ourselves, but nobody else. And I think Baltic states understand that very much. I'm not sure that everybody else, neither in the EU nor NATO, still get that to the level to which you and our Polish friends and and, and other Baltic states get it. I think for them, the prospect of their cities being overtaken and NATO not reacting fast enough I think for them, realizing that, you know, parts of their population can be subjected to the kind of tortures that Ukrainians, unfortunately, are subjected to, to them, it's still a a little bit of a too distant thought. 
And that's why they're so reluctant in um, acting more quickly on arms supply, for example, or so reluctant on putting more pressure on Russia through sanctions. Because if there's anything, you know, particular that we still need, it's, of course, you know, the heavy weaponry to get there sooner and save more lives and enable us to restore our territorial in integrity. Mm -hmm. But also it's weakening Russia. It's weakening Russia to the point that not just can, it cannot wage this war against us, but that it cannot even conceive of a notion of attacking any other democratic sovereign state. And um, I think I mentioned that, you know, there are 500 plus companies that have left Russia ever since the war, but there are another 400 who have not. And to me, that means that we're not still winning that battle mind, you know, the, mm -hmm. that battlefield of the mind, because that means that some companies are just waiting out uh, to, to profit to and to return to business as usual, as soon as there is some seeming... Uh, some seeming uh, concessions or some seeming peace. And because I know that it's a marathon, I know it's going to take time, I know we're not going to settle for any concessions until we know there is justice and accountability and lasting peace, um, they shouldn't be there. They should be helping us to win, not helping us to, not putting us in a, in a more difficult position to negotiate. It's like the opposite of what we need right now. I think that, I think that kind of concerning thing in this regard is uh, an element I picked up upon in the panel discussion in which you participated is this sort of attention deficit and how to sustain pro a prolonged commitment. Because of course, in uh, Europe, you know, uh, countries, are, countries have democratic systems, which means that politicians are in some way dependent on the election cycle. So what happens when in several European uh, countries we now will have elections and suddenly inflation, it's, it's an election topic, fuel prices, food prices, utility bills, you know, uh, th things like that. Uh, how do we, how do we not lose, not, not lose sight of, of what's important? Um, it's a difficult one because yes, um, Russia, um, having secured the dictatorship for its current president until he dies, probably, uh, is in a position of a more of a longer term game than any democratically elected uh, leader or, or country. Um, and I think, um, we can probably count on kind of two things. One is that, um, Russia always makes mistakes and always still pursues what it what it's said to do. Right now, they're on this mission that they're not going to waver from, unfortunately. Um, so there will be more action, and there will be more suffering, most likely. And I sincerely hope that there will be reaction to that. Would I want for people to be mindful and help us when even without more suffering? That would have been a more human thing to do. But in the current setup of the world, to do something more human means to pay a price, means to be able to pay a little bit more for gasoline or to close your windows, you know, and not uh, let the air, I don't know, out with, when the temperature is low and, and things like that. And those are small things, but hopefully people will begin to learn them. And I think also as more Ukrainians, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, they have to be abroad um, it's not that they wanted to immigrate, it happened because mm -hmm. of the war. Um, I think their stories should keep that alive. I hope that they will not just integrate into the societies, you know, where they are temporarily, but that they will also kind of keep a little bit of the pressure and, and, and um, um, help that story to, you know, to be told and, and to explain um, that they would be happily, um, they would happily go home if only there was an opportunity to um, stop Russia and to um, win this war and, and to recover the country that we also love. Absolutely. I think one final question on this, on this specific issue. Uh, I wonder if you have uh, picked up on this in any of your work or research. I have seen uh, studies suggesting that one uh, particularly nefarious, particularly nasty Russian disinformation tactic has been to specifically target countries hosting Ukrainian refugee populations. So maybe Baltic's a bit less so just due to size of numbers, but for example, Poland or, or Romania and so on, or Moldova. Uh, is there, uh, could you shed any insight into how, how these uh, refugee po populations have been targeted as, you know, bringing, uh, bringing crime or bringing some other, other negative 
Well, I think um, I think there will be uh, when 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 such numbers of people migrate uh, sooner or later there will be problems and there will be issues for the you know even to begin with the the housing the 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 economy. Um, I don't think anyone in Europe has ever taken such quantities of people. Definitely not in the recent history. So it's the biggest. Uh, kind of humanitarian crisis ever since the World War II and also the biggest migration probably since the World War II. So there will be problems um, and Russia will try to exploit them. I'm even more concerned, not in that, but in the fact that right now Russians are already um, kind of hunting for the minds of the Ukrainians who have moved abroad because they are in a much better position to do that. So the Russian Saturday schools, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Russian cultural centers, uh, they continue to have the funding, which Ukrainian community does not have right now because all of our effort is on the war. So, um, and the millions of Ukrainians, those who again will vote in the, any future Ukrainian elections, they're also abroad. So I think this is a very important battlefield that we also need to be kind of, you know, cognizant of and and um, to understand that it's so important for however long Ukrainians are staying abroad, for them to retain the Ukrainian identity, to retain touch with, with you know, reality on the ground, to um, to want in, in, you know, to influence in a good way um, the, the societies where they are, you know, from their Ukrainian perspective, they all have a role to play. Um, but, uh, Ukrainian, Ukraine as a state is now, you know, countering everything on so many multiple fronts. So it, it's a little bit of a stretch for, for us right now, but we are very well aware of, of, of this, uh, of this map of, uh, priorities. And I hope that we will have more solidarity to be able to tackle them. Thank you so much. It was a truly an eye-opening conversation and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much.